Hey Mohawks, welcome back to uh, Chemistry and 5-1 uh, Lecture Notes, and here we're going to go over these uh, slides. So we're going to talk about uh, electrons in atoms and revising the atomic model. And if you remember anything that I said about the electrons, it is the most important subatomic particle, uh, especially when it comes to chemical behavior or how that element is or atom is going to react with other elements. So let's go ahead and, and look at that uh, or go through these. Uh, why do scientists use mathematical models to describe the position of electrons? Well, they use models because, first of all, they can't see individual electrons. They can only tell you approximately where they're at. Uh, but we can use models to represent something so we can see how it reacts. And that's probably the best way. And again, mathematical models, just like physical models, are, are still models. Okay. So the energy levels in atoms. Well, what is Bohr's purpose uh, of his model of the atom? Okay. Well, he explained Bohr, and we're going to talk about Bohr's model of the electrons and, and stuff like that as we go through. And that's how, where we're going to get to. So how do we get there? Well, we start talking about Rutherford's atomic model and the limitations of that. It explained, it explained only a few simple properties uh, of atoms. Okay, it didn't explain a few other things. Have you ever looked carefully at the intro for this show? I mean, really carefully? If you have, you might have noticed that there's a diagram of an atom with little electrons orbiting the nucleus. But here's the thing. Atoms don't actually look like over the years, scientists have come up with different atomic models based on what we know about how they work. The atomic model that's in the SciShow intro was one of them, and it has a lot of history behind it. But the most accurate atomic models are a little more complicated, because atoms are complicated. By the start of the 20th century, scientists knew that atoms were made up of negatively charged electrons, plus some sort of positive charge. The tricky part was figuring out how these charges fit together. The running theory was that the electrons were embedded in a positive sphere, which was called the plum pudding model because it looked like a traditional Christmas pudding. But that all changed around 1911, when a scientist named Ernest Rutherford, along with his team at Manchester University, published the results of the famous gold foil experiment. Rutherford and his colleagues fired alpha particles, which are positively charged, at thin gold foil. According to the plum pudding model, the alpha particles should have just passed straight through the foil, because atoms would be mostly empty space with some charges scattered around. And atoms are mostly empty space, so most of the alpha particles did pass straight through the foil. But to Rutherford's surprise, some alpha particles were deflected by a lot. He concluded that an atom's positive charge was concentrated in a tiny central nucleus, and these nuclei were deflecting alpha particles that bounced off of them. He also predicted that the electrons were orbiting around the nucleus, kind of like how planets orbit the sun. That's why this model is sometimes called the planetary model. Rutherford was right about protons being in the middle with electrons around them, and you'll still see his model used today to explain the very basics of the atom. It's the one in the SciShow intro. But there was one major problem with the planetary model. It predicted that orbiting electrons would lose energy in the form of radiation, which would make them spiral inward and eventually crash into the nucleus. This implied that all atoms would eventually collapse. But we know that stable atoms do exist, so there had to be something missing. Just two years later, in 1913, Danish scientist Niels Bohr proposed an adjustment to the Rutherford model that solved this problem. Bohr's model predicted that electrons orbit at very specific energy levels, which he called orbits. The electrons could only orbit at precisely those levels, and so they couldn't spiral inwards. An electron could switch levels if it absorbed or released some energy, but only specific discrete levels were allowed, and electrons couldn't go below the lowest level. That explained why stable atoms didn't just collapse. Bohr's model quickly became the most popular model of an atom, and it's often used today to show the basic way that an atom is arranged. But it still wasn't totally right. One breakthrough was in 1932, when English physicist James Chadwick discovered that neutrons exist. Neutrons weren't electrically charged, and they helped explain why the nucleus was so heavy. Another breakthrough involved quantum mechanics, 
And the idea that electrons don't necessarily orbit the nucleus at all. In fact, electrons aren't even really in a specific place at any given time. Instead, they're kind of in lots of different places at once within a bigger area. Then, when you actually measure an electron, suddenly it's in one specific spot within that area. It's a weird concept that's very different from the way that we normally experience the world. But that's quantum mechanics for you. The area where you might find it if you try to measure it is called the electron cloud. In diagrams, normally the cloud is drawn darker where there's a high probability of the electron being there when you measure it. With the most basic atoms, like hydrogen and helium, this cloud looks kind of like a big sphere. And it turns out that electrons have the highest probability of being in one of Bohr's orbits, which is why you can use Bohr's model to simplify things. But when you get into bigger and bigger atoms with more and more electrons, these clouds begin to interfere with each other and start to have weirder shapes. So the electron cloud model is the most up-to-date model of an atom, and it's used by scientists around the world. But that doesn't make the other models useless. Like, Bohr's model can be helpful if you need to focus on energy levels and radiation. But if you're studying chemical bonds, you might need the electron cloud model to know where the electrons are. And if you want a model that shows off the fundamentals and still looks pretty cool, you might want to go for the planetary model. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow, which was brought to you by our patrons on Patreon. If you want to help support this show, go to patreon.com slash... Okay, so we noticed that there was some limitations to Rutherford's uh, atomic model. It explained only a few simple properties. It could not explain chemical properties of elements. Uh, and that's really where Niels Bohr came in. So the example of uh, this right here, of we see that it can explain why iron uh, will first glow before and after, uh, or I should say at higher temperatures. Now again, at higher temperatures, it glows because the electrons are getting excited and they're moving to those outer energy levels as in Niels Bohr, okay? So Niels Bohr came up with the, his uh, model of the uh, atom, and it showed that we had different energy levels. Now, this is the one that I like the most because I, we can explain just about everything from this one, okay? But we do have to realize that atoms do or can jump from one energy level to the next, but they'll always return to their base energy level. So if it's, if it's already on two, those electrons will go to the... You can go to the third, but they will go back down to their second energy level. And all the energy levels have to be filled from the inner out. And we're going to get to that when we talk about later in this section, start talking about the uh, electron, uh, or uh, excuse me, the, yeah, the electron model uh, and what it looks like of where the electrons are at. So Bohr proposed that an electron is found only in a specific circular path or orbit around the nucleus. Okay, each possible electron orbital in uh, Bohr's model was a fixed energy level. Okay, so he called, he called these things fixed energy levels. It had a fixed amount of energy and didn't really have any more than that. We could add energy to it, but it didn't go below that. Now, again... We can call this fixed amount of energy a quantum of energy. And it's the amount of energy to require to move from one energy level to the next. Now, this quantum of energy, if it goes into the atom, when it comes back, it gives off a photon of energy, okay, or light, as we talked about. Now, one thing about Bohr's model, it was kind of like rungs on this, un, you know, uneven rungs on this ladder here, where... Notice that the rungs at the bottom of the ladder are further away from, again, the nucleus would be here at the bottom, farther away, and they keep getting closer together as you go up. But like these rungs, you can't step halfway. You have to go all the way up there or not. So you, do, you would absorb enough energy to get you up to the next rung, but you couldn't, if you absorb only half that amount of energy, you would never go to that next rung. Okay, so what... How does Bohr's model improve upon Rutherford's model? That's the question. Well, Rutherford's model couldn't explain elements that have been heated to higher and higher temperatures that give off different colors of light. Bohr's model explains this on how that light was emitted. And like I said, when we added heat to it, that excited those outermost electrons. They moved to outer energy levels. And when they cooled back off, they gave up that energy 
or that quantum of energy in the form of a photon. And that photon would be light as we see it. Okay, so quantum mechanical model. What does the quantum mechanical model determine about the electrons in the atom? Well, really what it, what it does is that there is a mathematical equation that can describe the behavior of the electrons in the atom. We're not going to worry too much about, about that. We're going to get the basic type of, um, of answer when we talk about this. So really that we know that the quantum mechanical model is a mathematical solution. And that's all that we need to know. And like Bohr's model, the quantum mechanical model of the atom restricts the energy of electrons to certain values, okay, which means certain energy levels. Unlike Bohr's model, however, the quantum mechanical energy does not specify an exact path that the electron takes around the nucleus. And that's the biggest difference, that direct path. So the quantum mechanical model determines and allows energies of an electron to have uh, have and how likely it is to find the electron in various locations, okay, which basically we're going to say in that energy level or that electron cloud, that's where we're most likely going to find it. So this is the most common or the best one, as she said in the video. So let's go on. We're going to see that the electron cloud is the most likely place that we're going to find electrons. That's what the quantum mechanical model actually tells us. Okay, but it, what it doesn't tell us is where actually the electrons are. It's somewhere in that cloud around the nucleus. Okay, so how are quantum mechanical model and Bohr's model alike, and how are they different? So like the Bohr's model, the quantum mechanical model restricts the energy, okay, to certain values, and it can go, can't go down any further and collapse into the nucleus. Okay. Unlike Bohr's model, though, the quantum mechanical model uh, does, not specify, ugh, does not specify an exact path that the electrons are going to take. Matter of fact, we'll find as atoms get more and more complicated that these paths are quite unique in their shape. So atomic orbitals. How do suborbitals of a principal energy, energy level differ? So solutions to Schrodinger's equation gives the energies or energy levels of uh, that an electron has. Okay, and so we call this mathematical expression is called the atomic orbital. Okay, an atomic orbital is represented by a picture as a region of space, which is high probability of finding that electron, and we call that the electron cloud. We're not going to worry about quantum numbers at this point, okay? I think that we better serve. So we're going to go bypass the quantum numbers, okay, and all these things that look at it. So this is what we really want to get to at when we talk about that. There are different types of orbitals. Here is the S orbital. It is spherical in shape. Each orbital can hold two electrons. So the S orbital, which re is represented by the first two columns of the periodic table, okay, can only hold two electrons. The p orbital is a dumbbell-shaped orbital, and there are three poor, uh, p orbitals. They represent the last six electron or elements in the periodic table. So 1a and 2a, and then 3a through 8a. We get down to the, uh, actually for any given principal energy level, then one, there's one s orbital. There's three p orbitals. We go on, there's five d orbitals. Those represent the 10 elements that are in the b section of your periodic table, if you remember that. So 3b, 4b, 5b, 6b, 7b, 8b, 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 1b, and 2b. Those are the lower ones on your periodic table. And then if we move on to the next ones, we actually see, um, for, hey, let me just go back to this one. We have five different p orbitals. Each p orbital can hold two electrons for a total of 10. And then we notice in, those, in that uh, b section of elements, there's 10 electrons.
I absolutely love teaching. I just wish I had more time to prepare fun lessons. That's fine. Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and this is Chemistry Essentials video 007. And it's on the quantum mechanical model. In other words, it's going to be our current model of what an atom looks like. Before we had this uh, quantum mechanical model, we had what's called a shell diagram. And so when you look at neon, neon had two electrons in the first shell, and then it would have eight electrons in the next shell. And we figured that out by looking at spectral data. And so what we've discovered since then is um, uncertainty in those electrons and a little bit more of the characteristics of electrons. And so this has kind of been replaced with the quantum mechanical model. Now the shell model works great at making predictions and so does the quantum mechanical model. They're just different theoretical um, concepts of what an atom looks like. And so our shell model really is based on Coulomb's law, which talks about the, the interactions between protons and electrons. But there's a couple of things about electrons that we discovered. One was the uncertainty principle. In other words, when you're looking at an electron, the act of light bouncing off of that and coming back to you changes the momentum of the electron. So you can never know both the location and the momentum of an electron. There's uncertainty there. And so they live in these clouds of probability. And so um, since they don't follow specific orbits, we came up with this new term, which is an orbital, which is where they're going to spend their time. Another important thing about electrons is that they have spin. So they're going to either have a clockwise magnetic spin or a counterclockwise magnetic spin. As a result of that, you can only have two in every orbital. And so we really had to throw out this idea of the shell, or at least modify it so it fit with the depth. And so now we have this quantum mechanical model, and we can use com complex equations and computers to develop software that predicts how atoms are really going to interact. So Coulomb's law, remember, predicted where electrons are going to be, you have these positive charges on the inside, and you have these negative charges of the electron. And so the larger these charges get, the larger the force holding them together is going to be. But as they move away, as the radius increases, we're going to decrease that force. But there's two problems with that general shell model. Number one, they don't flow in these specific orbits, and that's because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And then the other one is that spin means we can only have two electrons in every orbital. And so this idea of eight in one shell is just not going to work. And so there are these orbitals. And if we start on the inside, the first one's going to be called the S orbital. And then we move to these things, uh, which are polar. And so we call those uh, the P orbitals. They don't come from polar, but that's how I remember it. And then we move into the D orbitals. And then we move into the F orbitals. I don't know if I have those. But essentially, they're all of these clouds of probability where electrons sit. And so we have what are called quantum numbers. And the first three are going to determine what that orbital looks like. So the first one is going to be n, and that's going to be the size of the orbital. As n gets larger, then that area of which those electrons are going to be is going to get larger. We next have L, which is going to be the shape of that orbital. It could be an S, a P, a D, or an F. Then we move into the orientation, which is going to be m sub L. And, and so S can only have one orientation. P can have three orientations. And so it just goes 1, 3, 5, 7. And so when we're adding in the orbital diagram, as we're adding electrons to it, we're going to put a lot more electrons in the orbitals of the F subgroup than we are, uh, of, for example, the P. And then there's going to be the spin. And since those electrons have spin, it's counterclockwise or clockwise, we can only put two in every orbital. And so what we can do is we can develop Schrodinger's equation as an example of that that's going to predict where these electrons are found. And by doing that, we can predict not only what an atom looks like, but how atoms are going to interact. And it's so complex that lots of times we need computers to do that. And so did you learn how the quantum mechanical model can refine the classical shell model? Well, I would point you to these two things, uncertainty of the electrons and the spin. And it's not like we throw out the shell model. It's just that we're getting better and better models of what an atom looks like right? based on the data that we're getting. We'll talk about that in the next video, but I hope that was helpful. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back. Okay, let's go back to this right here. Now, notice this was the d orbitals. There's five d orbitals uh, that can hold ten total electrons. We go on to the next one, and we're gonna actually move on past this one because we already did that one. So we notice that we have energy levels here, and we have our sub energy levels. What I'm more concerned about is
looking over here at the maximum number of electrons, and remember, this is not in the outermost energy, energy level, but what the energy level can hold, okay? So when I look at the first, uh, the first uh, N1, that's just two electrons. But N2, we have different orbitals. We have one S orbital, and we have three P orbitals, so it can hold eight. We go to the N3, okay, there's three suborbitals. We have the S, the P, and the D, and they can hold a total of 18. Now, again, if these numbers over here look familiar, that's because, if you remember, we wrote them on the right side of the periodic table, the first column, or first period, second and third period, fourth and fifth period, and then sixth and seventh period. And again, these F orbitals really represent the elements that are the two rows that are at the bottom of the periodic table. These are the one in the middle or the B group. The P's are the uh, 3A through 8A. And then the S's is just the very first two columns, which would be column 1A and 2A. It'll get a little bit easier as we go through this when we talk about the electron configurations. Okay. So again, we're not going to worry about N and N2 and those numbers. What we really want to know is that what energy level or what orbital do we have and how many electrons it can have in it and where that is located in the periodic table. And so we'll go ahead and talk about that. So we're going to bypass all this stuff. Okay, this question here we can ask, why do scientists no longer use physical models to describe the motion of electrons? It's because they really don't know where they're at. They couldn't, you know, the physical models were just too large. The theoretical models, uh, you know, showed the models did not really show it correctly. Schrodinger's mathematical model uh, was better. And then the quantum mechanical model is probably the best that we have. And it uses Schrodinger's equation for that, which we don't really have to know Schrodinger's equation. Well, that's at the, the end of that. And you see, we hear our key concepts that we have to, that you should know. And as far as our uh, terms, well, there are terms. And this is the big idea that ends it. So uh, that's it for 5-1. As always, hey, go Mohawks. Nelson out.